Hello, Ruth. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Ruth Delaney from Ireland. She is a great shoulder surgeon and she's Irish, and that means a lot for me. You know that. Uh, hi, Ruth. How are you doing? Hi, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me. I'm doing well. Okay. Uh, let's begin with the, one of the most important questions. Why a shoulder surgeon? How did you become a shoulder surgeon? I think a combination of reasons. Um, I always liked anatomy in medical school. And in the beginning, uh, the way they taught anatomy that time was that we started learning with the brachial plexus and the upper extremity. And then later on in the year, everything else. And you always remember the first things the best. Maybe you spend more time absorbing them. And I really liked surgery as I went through the clinical years and orthopedics. Um, and because I was involved in sports, it all made sense. Um, with the shoulder, I always felt that there were a lot of things we didn't fully understand or, you know, have figured out yet. Um, and maybe things weren't quite as developed as with hips and knees and not as many people were doing it. Um, I had some of my own experiences with shoulder surgeries being a tennis player. And I guess that made me more interested uh, because I had some shoulder surgeries myself. And then... I discovered that the community of shoulder surgeons internationally was really friendly. And I was in the US as a resident, I was from Ireland. And sometimes in some of the other subspecialties, uh, they'd say, well, this is what we do in North America, but in Europe they do that or they think differently. Whereas in shoulders, the Americans would listen to their French, who would be friends with the Japanese, who would listen to the South Americans. Everybody talks together and that was really attractive too. So I think all of those things and then the fact that as a shoulder surgeon, you can still be, you know, the arthroplasty surgeon, you can be a trauma surgeon, you can be a sports surgeon, you can do scopes, you can have all the different aspects of orthopedics in, in one joint. Um, so all of those reasons together uh, drew me to shoulder surgery. Good. Yes, I agree. And that's a feeling that most of the people has, uh, have uh, related to how we deal between shoulder surgeons. I don't know if it is because it is a young subspeciality, but it's very democratic, very friendly, isn't it? It is. And I have friends now in lots of countries that I, you know, would never have imagined because of shoulder surgery, yeah. like, like you in Argentina. Yes. So. yes. And is there someone that you consider your teacher, someone who was the, your mentor? Yeah, sure. I think probably my biggest mentor was JP Warner. Um, I was lucky enough to get to go to Harvard for residency and so I got to know JP when I was just a junior resident and I did some research work with him before getting to work clinically with him then later as a fellow and during that fellowship I got to go to France as well and Gilles Valch became a really important mentor for me um, and it's really amazing to still be able to talk with those guys and discuss cases and um, you realize when you start operating on your own how much you've taken from them. Sometimes you don't realize how much you're learning when you're there as a resident or the fellow. And then when you're on your own, you're thinking constantly about the things they've taught you and their voices in your head in the OR. And now in practice, I've been in practice for six years and um, traveled to lots of conferences and given talks with people and you acquire other mentors in this different stage of your career too. Um, people that you just get to know really well. I consider you a mentor now, even though I never trained with you, but we, uh, we you know, now we talk about things and uh, shoulder things and conferences and open bank cards and everything. Um, and another person who has sort of become like a mentor now in this later stage is George Athwal, because I've just gotten to know him and discuss things with him. And uh, it's amazing to have that sort of support, um, you know, at the end of an email, whenever you want. Yes, George is a great guy, really great guy. Yeah, and fantastic. What technique, which technique do you prefer? Which one? I know that we are supposed to do everything, or but there's, some, some, there's always someone that we prefer. Yeah, there are so many that I enjoy doing, um, and I love both scopes and open, but um, I really like the latter day procedure. It's one of my favorite operations um, because it's, you know, it's not always easy, um, but it's very 
elegant the idea and how it works and when you see it at the end you know um, it's a little bit stressful to take something take the coracoid and put it where it's not supposed to be um, but it's it's really great how it works and I like it for my rugby players because I don't worry about them so much but it's pretty solid. You perform it open or arthroscopically? I do it open yeah I put the scope in at the beginning um, so that I can see what the joint looks like. Uh, I think it's good to know if they have pre-existing arthritis so that if they get arthritic later, you have a picture of, well, it wasn't really all the operation maybe. Um, and I, I like to um, expose the coracoid arthroscopically for five minutes, make sure there's no other pathology. And then I just go open. I try to, uh, I try to do it like Gilles um, as close as I can to imitate uh, his amazing skill. But yeah, the very classic uh, way that he describes is sort of the way I do it. Good. You know, I trained with Dr. Rockwood and he used to say that uh, Latarche surgery is not the worst surgery in shoulder surgery. It's the worst surgery in orthopedic surgery. But yeah. that was kind of a kind of bias because he received a large amount of fail uh, Mm -hmm. J surgery that was performed were performed in the U.S. perhaps with not the best indication or not the best technique. Uh, mm -hmm. Time I learned that it's a very reliable surgery. I I prefer to indicate it in specific cases. Uh, I would not indicate a latter J in a first dislocation, uh, you know, or in a young guy with no uh, defects. But I think it it has its indication and it is a very nice and reliable, reliable surgery. Yeah, I think it's all about the indication rather than the surgery. Um, and uh, for us, it's tricky. We're trying to figure out at the moment and we're designing a, a trial um, where all of these things fit. You know, there are some patients that it's very easy to decide to do a latter day. They have bone loss. You know they'll fail a soft tissue reconstruction. Um, the difficult ones for me in my practice, because we have a lot of collision athletes, we have these crazy Irish sports, hurling and Gaelic mm -hmm. football, um, as well as rugby. And um, the collision athletes with subcritical bone loss, um, they don't do well with arthroscopic bank art, but maybe it's too aggressive to do latter -Gay. But if I was French, I would probably not think about it and do latter -Gay on everybody. And, you know, those guys are really good at that operation, so they have low complication rates. Um, but then... You know, there's a place probably for the open bank art, and that's what I came around to thinking about the last couple of years. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's something that we're looking at because as surgeons, we hate when our operation fails. So mm -hmm. you do some sort of stabilization surgery, and if the patient dislocates again, you're really upset. Um, but if you do a latter jet on somebody that maybe didn't need it and they get a complication, that's bad too. Or, you know, people who maybe they're stable, but they're stiff and they're painful or they get arthritic um, because you were really aggressive with your capsular shift in an open bank art or, or with a latter J. So um, trying to balance the, the pros and cons of each of those instability surgeries is, is really tricky. Um, and so that's something that um, I'm really interested in. It is really frustra frustrating to <clears throat> have a patient with a red dislocation. And mm. generally, it takes a couple of years. So when you begin, yeah. you think that you are a great surgeon, that you don't have complications, and after a couple of years, they appear. And exactly. Like that, you know, especially in our beginning, because uh, in my case, uh, we were not doing Latarge uh, at the beginning. We were not considering the, the role of the bone loss at the beginning as we do now so we were like uh, in some case open to more complications related with redislocations the good thing was that as banca does not alter the anatomy you always have a yeah. good way to to deal with that you know with a reoperation and mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about uh, the atmosphere of the shoulder world uh, you came to Argentina for the international meeting. Was your first international meeting or you were before in other ones? Um, I went to the ICSES uh, one other time and that was in 2010 in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. And I really, 
yeah, I really remember that meeting because um, I was only a third year resident and I had done a project with JP and it got accepted for a podium. And he said, oh, you know, it's okay if you don't want to go all the way to Edinburgh, I'll present it. And I said, no, I, I really want to go because um, maybe I'll want to go back and practice in Ireland and the European guys will be there. Some of the Irish guys will be there. Um, I think it would be important for me to to go and do the presentation, even though like I'm, I'm junior. And he said, of course, yeah, that's fine. And it was so exciting because um, it was one other resident and, and I from Harvard and JP brought us everywhere with him that week. He introduced us to everybody and uh, all of these guys were so famous and mm -hmm. it was amazing to shake hands with Bernie Murray and Christian Gerber because JP introduced me to them and it was like, uh, you know, when a teenager meets their pop stars or something, you like almost want to ask for their autographs and you're sort of like, I can't believe that we just had dinner with Christian Gerber and uh, you know the, of course these guys are normal people with real people they you know but to me they were the superstars of this um, specialty I was interested in and to um, be able to meet them and have conversations with them was uh, was really exciting and then the other thing that happened at that meeting was that um, one of the shoulder surgeons from Dublin Hannan Mullet was there and I introduced myself to Hannan and we were chatting and he, he said, oh, what's, you know, what's a girl from Cork doing here at this meeting with J.P. Warner? Oh, my God. And so I explained that I was a resident at Harvard and everything. And then he said, OK, well, next time you're home, um, come visit me. So the following Christmas, I was home and I went to visit him in his OR uh, at the hospital where I now work. He introduced me to the uh, surgeon who set up that hospital. And that was the beginning of the pathway for me to come back to Ireland. So all because of getting to talk to Hannah in, in Edinburgh at ICSES, um, I ended up having a way to get back home and um, an opportunity to set up a practice here. So um, the meetings, you know, and that's, I guess, the difficult thing now with, with COVID, you know, the meetings are about more than what happens on the podium or um, the ICLs or everything. Of course, the scientific content is important to us, um, but all of these other conversations that happen uh, on the side of the meeting, um, can lead to amazing things. Yes, I always say that we have no idea of the shockwave that a meeting releases, you know. We have people that got married, people that find a job, uh, many, many things that when you organize a meeting, you, you never realize how you get into the people's life in, in a positive way. And that's very nice. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the opportunity to travel somewhere for a meeting, somewhere maybe you wouldn't have gone, and then the people you meet. Um, so my other kind of favorite conference I was at would have been the ICSES, the other time I went in Argentina just this past year. Um, because again, it was an opportunity to visit Argentina and explore afterwards some other parts. And at the meeting itself also then, other things were happening. Um, I gave a talk and then Philippe Valenti emailed me right afterwards and said, hey, can you come and talk about that at my meeting in Paris? And that was really cool for me as a young surgeon at the beginning of my career to get invited to be on the faculty for Philippe's meeting because he happened to be in the room when I gave a talk about some research we did. And all of, like you said, a shockwave is a perfect description yeah. of the ripples that go from the meeting and, um, it was that was a, a really great trip as well as being a great meeting um, so you know hopefully um in the future before too long we'll get back to being able to have our meetings uh in person you know of course of course but because nothing can replace that and uh, you know after the meeting in scotland that was a great meeting uh, i visited uh, Dublin and I was in Ireland for the first time with my children so again it, it, it everything is kind of related you know um, yeah. and tell me a little about the meeting you are organizing in Dublin because we yeah, know there are some changes yeah there's some changes so um, uh, we are going to be hosting the European meeting, the SESIC meeting uh, in Dublin, which for us as a small country and a small shoulder society is a big deal to get this bid. Um, and originally that was planned for September 2021, so um, a little more than a year away. Uh, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, SESIC have made the really sensible decision and made the decision early that this year's meeting in Poznan and Poland shouldn't go ahead. I think it would have been very difficult 
even if you technically could have people in a meeting, it would be really hard for everybody to travel. So all the things we spoke about, about people coming together, it wasn't going to work. So Poznan is now going to happen in September 2021. Uh, there will be a virtual SESIC meeting September 2020 instead, which will be interesting, something different. Uh, that means that Dublin will then move later. But because we have another ICSES in Rome in 2022, and we don't hold SESIC those years. Uh, from now on, whenever ICSES is in Europe, we're not going to have a SESIC meeting. Um, so that means Dublin is now 2023. So we have three years to uh, put our show together, which means there's no excuse for not having a, a great meeting. So um, we're a little disappointed that it's far away, but um, it doesn't change anything. We're going to have a great time in Dublin. And uh, we, uh, we, we had the Guinness storehouse booked for the social dinner. So hopefully uh, they'll still take another booking from us. And uh, we have our convention center arranged um, for the new dates. So we'll still have the really nice convention center. And uh, Dublin, Dublin will hopefully be a good place for everybody to visit. For sure, for sure. And it's good to let the people know that uh, there is a change so they can save the date yeah. for two Of Saturday. course, yeah. So it'll be September 2023. We hope September 19th uh, to 23rd. They need to just finalize that date uh, with the convention center. So we'll know in about two weeks and uh, I think Sesek will put out uh, a definite announcement on the date. But yeah, September 2023 for Dublin. Great. And what about your free time? Do you keep on practicing tennis? Yeah, I like to play. Um, I, for a few years I hadn't played and then um, where I live now there's uh, a tennis club like five minutes away. So last year I joined there and dug out my rackets again. And yeah, tomorrow I'll play tennis with a friend who's a neurologist. Um, we used to play when we were juniors and then now we both are in medicine. So it's a nice way to um, have something else. I love to exercise. I like to get out and go for a run. That was an easy thing to do. When I lived in Boston. I was a resident. I was busy. You don't need anything else. You just have a little bit of time. So yeah, for me, those are probably the, the main uh, sports and hobbies. And traveling is one of my favorite things too. So um, yeah, sometime when the world goes back to normal, we'll get back to that. For sure. For sure. Uh, finally, Ruth, how do you see the future in Ireland related to shoulder surgery? I know that you have a small but very active shoulder society, shoulder and elbow society in Ireland. Uh, how do you think things will develop in the future? Yeah, it's an interesting time for us. Um, so you know, in the last, I guess, 10 years or so, there's been more shoulder surgeons in Ireland. Uh, before that, there were really probably only two guys, two or three guys who were focused on the shoulder, and then a lot of other general orthopedic surgeons who were happy to take care of some shoulder things. Um, and then in 2016, we realized, well, we have enough fellowship trained focused shoulder surgeons and elbow surgeons to form a shoulder and elbow society. Um, we are a relatively small country in terms of our population of about 5 million. So uh, it's a small society, um, but we have had a great time organizing a meeting every year. We've had some great people come over, Tony Romeo, Pascal Bolo, Evan Flato. Um, those guys have been um, our guests this year. We had Gilles Valsh. Um, and Alex Castagna is coming next year. So it's always amazing for us that these guys are, are willing to come to our little meeting. And it's really, um, it's really nice because it's uh, sort of unique now because all the societies have gotten bigger. So ours is still small. We have case presentations. Sometimes even the patients are there. And then based on that momentum, Hannon and I decided, well, you know, we could put a bid in for SESIC. We could bring all of Europe and the wider world to, to Dublin for sh a shoulder meeting and, and that's where that came from. Um, so I think that the future is, um, is exciting. We've put Ireland on the map a little bit more in terms of shoulder surgery. Um, and the, you know, the access to shoulder surgeons I think is better now for patients because there are a few more of us. Um, so it's not as difficult for the patients to get to see a shoulder surgeon. Um, and we have, you know, an interesting kind of cross-section of, of patients, everybody from those sports guys we were just talking about with the instability. And then I think the most common thing I see is probably cough disease. And then uh, we have the older population and it's changing a little bit. Um, the older population often would have been very reluctant to consider surgery. They have shoulder arthritis and think there's nothing you can do. And even some of the GPs, didn't realize there was such a thing as a shoulder replacement. We do talks for the GPs to 
um, give them information about shoulders and, and the physiotherapists as well. And at one of those talks, not long after I first came back, a really experienced GP said, oh, I, I didn't know there was such thing as shoulder replacement, like, like hip replacement, the same thing. I said, yeah, yeah, we can replace a shoulder joint and uh, it's really a great pain relief for those patients. So I think the awareness of arthroplasty is improving and maybe the willingness of the patients to, to come and look for it. So I think we're starting to have better and better standards of, of shoulder care in Ireland. Um, and more research happening. Um, it's, it's difficult because there's not much infrastructure uh, for research and not much money. Um, but I think people are, are trying to put a little bit more science uh, to their practice as well. And we encourage that with our own national meeting every year. So there's, there's more and more happening. And I can't believe that it's been possible to have a practice that's 100% shoulder in Ireland. That was something I worried about to come home. You know, when coming home, I thought, okay, well, I might have to do like hip and knee replacements just to pay the bills, just to have enough work. Um, but actually, um, there's, it was the right time. There was a lot of uh, shoulder work to do. Um, so I think we're uh, entering a really good phase of, of shoulder and elbow as a specialty in Ireland and a lot of enthusiasm building a lot of good young guys. Of course, of course. And it is interesting that how the evolution is parallel in different times in different countries, because I remember that once a patient came to visit Dr. Rogut and she said, I am not going to have a shoulder prosthesis because my doctor told me that this, it is an experimental surgery you know and it, it it was difficult to deal with that at the beginning here in argentina as well but you know it's time and people get used to that but there's one thing i do not agree with you that is that the irish society is small and it's not small there are 70 more than 70 million people with irish ancestors all over the world that's true yeah. yes the diaspora the diaspora uh, do you still have that crazy uh, project before CSE? Yeah, we do. So um, this is something that we're going to work on and I'm going to uh, certainly uh, get your help with this because you're like the international diaspora experts for Ireland. Um, so usually before SESIC, we, you know, there's some uh, one day meeting, um, sometimes with a, a visiting country or, you know, the local society does something. And so uh, our plan for SESIC, which now won't be till 2023, was that the day before the meeting, um, so probably on the, on the Wednesday, uh, we will organize a meeting for the Irish diaspora. So every uh, country ha that has links to Ireland, which is many, you know, can be involved. We certainly would look at the, the more common ones, um, places like the US, Australia, um, Australia, New Zealand, of course, Argentina, where there's amazing Irish connections, um, and a number of other countries, and structure a meeting for the day where we have, yes, talks about shoulders and also about culture and interlinks between our countries. So I think it will be something unique and different um, to most of our meetings. It'll be fun. Would be nice. Would be really great. And especially many Irish people will be surprised about the links. Um, there are yes. many, many crazy and interesting stories going around and I think it, it's going to be very nice. Well, we, we will wait these three years for that meeting, a uh, very excited meeting for sure, and it's going to be a, a great place to go. Ruth, I appreciate very much your time, your, your kindness, and it was great talking to you. Uh, for sure, you will come back to Argentina. There's no discussion about that. Great, I, I can't wait. I love, uh, I loved the two trips that I've had to Argentina so far, and uh, it was really nice to get to talk to you today. Thank you very much, and uh, take care. Take care. Bye, Daniel. Bye, bye.